Right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. This morning is a bit of a special day because we've got one of my favourite photographers, Andrew Sanders, <coughs> here. It is going to be his last talk he gives. He's retiring after today. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It is being recorded, but you won't, unfortunately, it's, going to, it's for, his, for Andrew's own file. So he's going to do that. Archive. <laughs> is that the word? Clash. Yeah, we'll do it anyway. <laughs> uh, oh, by the way, to all of you, happy Lincolnshire Day. I think it's very brave of the second best county in the country to have yeah. a day to all to itself. <laughs> <laughs> best being Yorkshire, of course. <laughs> so, anyway, we'll start. Andrew Sanderson. Well, thanks for having me back, everybody. Um, before I start, can I just apologise for my toothless grin? I was in hospital recently and they whipped a pipe out and knocked a blooming crown off and I haven't had it sorted yet, so. Right, we'll just start with, as you probably know, if you, if you remember my work from last time, there's a range of work, there's landscapes, there's portraits, there's still lives, there's all kinds of stuff. So we'll just start with some sort of general landscapes. Feel free to ask questions, take the mickey, comment, anything, because I'd like a bit of a lively debate if possible. We've got a lot of these old mills where I live um, in the Home Valley uh, and the Cone Valley just beside it. Um, lots of these lovely old buildings sitting around, which are great for, for taking pictures. This one is actually in Liverpool, not in my area. Oh yes, everything's shot on film and printed, hand printed in a dark room. Um, I do own a digital camera, a D800, but I don't use it for any proper photography. Um, my wife's a painter, so I copy her work on it. But other than that, it doesn't get used. So this is taken on medium format. Um, as you can see, it's just shot on a cold, misty morning. Do you have a, a film and process of choice, or is it...? Preference, I wouldn't say yeah, choice, yeah. Because I'd like to try all sorts of things. Um, it's mainly HP5. Um, process, that varies. Sometimes I, I'm in love with it, ID11. Sometimes I'm in love with Rodinol. I've been playing around a lot with uh, James Lane's 510 Pyro. Yeah. But and I'm going back to uh, ID11 again and Rodinol, I think. Just because the, the, the Pyro is a lovely developer, but it's like honey, and it's very difficult to measure accurately. And so if you're in a bit of a hurry, it tends to be a bit more laborious. Another medium format shot, just uh, taken on the moors near where I live. Um, there are footpaths across the moors, and where, where there's a stream, where people would, would walk regularly, they would make these little bits of footpaths so it isn't all muddy. So it actually just stops there. It looks... It looks a bit odd in when you come across these places, like a little bit of a footpath in the middle of nowhere, but that was what drew me to it. Thirty-five mil. That's just taken in Leeds. Uh, I love old architecture. I love messy places where people have left evidence of things that they've done, a little bit of history there, a little bit of interest in the picture. What are your lens of choice just out of Well, that's a 20mm, that's a Nikon 20mm, which is a superb <coughs> lens. I usually carry, um, if I just go out and I'm walking and I want something light to carry, it'll be a 28mm, a 50 and a 135. But if I've got um, transport, I'll carry a bit more. So it's okay with primes? Yes, I always work with primes. I mean, I do have zooms, but I tend to use the primes most because I prefer the, the quality. Whoops. So um, I was using a, a Nikon F3 for quite a long time, but it's, um, it's gone kaput, the spring in the back has come through the shutter. So um, I'm using an old F2 at the moment. But I also have a fondness for Pentax Spotmatics. I've used those for a long, long time, so they occasionally get an outing as well. What you need them for? Um, Yashika Matt, Rowley, 3.5, um, 
Uh, Mamiya RB67, um, and sometimes a little folding, Net R66. That last one uh, of the cobbled path was taken on a little folding, Net R66. And uh, optically, they are superb little cameras. You know. uh, basically, you mix a TLR and SLR. Yeah, yeah. It, it often depends on what, how far I'm walking, what I can carry. You know, so the RB67 is quite a big bulky thing. I've got two lenses for it, so that's quite a lot of weight, and I wouldn't go on a long hike with that, but I might just sling a twin lens reflex over my shoulder. Um, misty graveyards, who can resist a misty graveyard? This particular day, it was so cold, my hand was sticking to the metal of the tripod, but it did mean that everything was sort of highlighted with frost, and there's a, there's a cobweb in there, and the shapes in the cobweb were sort of echoing the shapes in the carving, that was what originally drew me to the scene. I spotted that scene, um, drive, I used to drive to work, I, I, I'm self-employed now, but at one point I was working in a dark room uh, about 15 miles away. And on the drive to work, I would see this church in the distance and think, oh, I must get a shot of that, I must get a shot. And then I had a camera with me one particular day and it was misty and the sun was coming up, everything was in place. And so I pulled over and ran down and got this shot. And shortly after that, they built over all of this area, so it's impossible to get that shot now. I think it's all... Um, car showrooms and commercial greenhouses and things like that. I mean, there have been, been plenty of times when I've intended to photograph a place and never got round to it, and then the opportunity's gone, the building's been demolished or whatever. So that's the home valley where I live, home Firth. Just think compost would be a lot back <laughs> Do you have to do a lot of work to that, or is that kind of... Well, having never used film, I'm just okay. trying to... I don't think of it as a lot of work, because I'm used to doing it. I don't like a straight print. I think a straight print is really boring. And if I process a film and make a contact sheet, which I t try to do with every film, when I'm looking at the images, that's the most boring part of photography for me, is looking at the contact sheet, because there's no... Nothing's really standing out. So the, the trick is to find the images on the contact sheet that have got potential and then emphasise the areas that are interesting and subdue the other areas that are less interesting. So that's done with the, the extra burning in or the dodging and so on. So, yeah, you might call it a lot of work, but without it, the picture wouldn't be worthwhile. And this is quite an extreme example of that. So that's taken on a day when the sky is white and there's, there's no, it's featureless. So it's been burnt in so heavily, it looks like a stormy day. And then it's burnt in at the bottom here, just to draw your attention up towards the church on the hill. Are these all, this, all of the same paper, Andrew? Oh no, there's a range of papers. This is a matte, uh, a matte fibre paper that Ilford make. And what t tends to happen is that um, when the print's wet, you can see all the detail in the shadows, as you can see there. But when it dries down, that information just goes into a dead black. So if you want to lose things in a print into, into darkness, that's a great paper for it. Whereas with a glossy paper, it, you, re, you retain the information in the shadows, and sometimes that's important. So, so far, the images you've seen have been sharp. And the next few images are not so sharp for various reasons. I like the way the hillside behind this looked so sort of dominating and, and large, but it's so far away that I couldn't get it with ordinary optics. I had to use a 500mm lens, a 2 times converter and a 3 times converter. So that's about the equivalent of a 3,000mm lens. But at that sort of distance, you'd get such a lot of atmospheric haze that it would be flat and dead. But on this particular day, the sun was shining off the snow, which was a high contrast scene. So they balanced each other out and I was able to get the shot. But it does mean that it's not particularly sharp. I'm using the, the two converters has dropped the, the quality a bit. But it's st I'd still rather have the shot 
slightly soft and not have it at all. This one's slightly soft because the lens on the camera, this is a taken on a 5x7 ca camera, and the lens is off an old photocopier. So it's, a, it's what we used to be known as a process lens. It's a, it's a fixed focal length, and it's stuck open at its maximum aperture, so there's no way of stopping it down. So with a lens like that, you have to choose situations where there's not much light, and you can just cap and uncap the, the lens for the exposure, or use a very slow uh, emulsion. So you'll see some other examples of that lens further on. The, the glow on that isn't from a diffuser. It looks like I've put a diffuser on the camera, but it isn't. It's a twin lens reflex. It's an old Roliflex. And the bottom lens is all scratched from somebody wiping droplets of water off it every time it got a splash on it. And I, I've always assumed it was some chap doing weddings on it with, and he had a, a tweed tie and he's used that to uh, wipe them and he scratched the emulsion. <laughs> and I've always had that picture in my mind and I sent it off to be repaired earlier this year and the repairer found bits of um, confetti inside the camera. <laughs> God, God knows how they got in there. <laughs> but it has a lovely glow, this, this lens. It's, it doesn't work in every situation because it flares really badly, but when it, when it works, it's lovely. And for portraits, it's got a special magic. Yeah, the softness is much more apparent on this one but this is a homemade lens. So are you familiar with uh, supplementary lenses? So it's a simple magnifying glass that screws onto the front of your mm -hmm. camera lens for close-up. So it's basically two of those and a cardboard tube. Yeah? So there, it's, a, it's a symmetrical lens, but it's a simple optical construction. And then that's mounted on a board and, and placed on a 5.4 camera. Uh, and by altering the uh, size of a cardboard aperture in, in the centre, I can get roughly the sort of suggestion of sharpness in the middle and then fall off that I'm after. Is that warm toned paper? Yes, but it's also toned slightly as well. Now the softness on this one comes from poor optics. This is taken on a plastic Holger camera. Which, yeah, they, they do produce uh, quite magical results uh, occasionally but they are a total pain in the arse to use. And I decided I'm not using mine ever again, because it's just so, there's so much waste with them. So many frames don't work, so light leaks or whatever it might be. But when, it, when, it, when I have used it and it, it's worked, I've been quite pleased with the results. I like it because you don't have to put batteries in. <laughs> <laughs> you do need a roll of insulating tape, which I think I've Yes, you do. And, uh, and some rubber bands to stop the back from springing off. Yeah. Right, this one and the next one are done on a homemade lens. Uh, well, not homemade in the sense of the last one that I described, but a homemade teleconverter. So it's basically a hollow tube with a cardboard disc in the middle, hole cut in it, and then a simple concave lens stuck onto that. So it, it works as a teleconverter, but it's not optically, <laughs> not optically corrected. Um, I can get a pretty sharpish image if I stop the lens right down, but if I use it wide open, I get lots of softness. What's the paper on that one, please? This is Ilford Warm Tone fibre, and it's uh, toned, sepia toned. So that's the same lens again. This is uh, taken outside of the library in Huddersfield. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. There are two statues on the steps, um, sort of Egyptian-looking statues. Um, one more with that homemade teleconverter. That's done on the, on the Dutch, as they used to say, on the tilt, just for a more dreamlike image. Um, it was done because they used to be, in the 70s, you used to be able to buy books called psychic photography and stuff, and they'd be like ball lightning and all sorts of weird phenomena. A lot of fake images in, in these books. 
And there was one set of pictures that I remember by an American guy called Ted Sirios, which is like a made-up name. But he would get a Polaroid camera and hold it to his forehead and think of a picture and then pull the Polaroid out and it would have an image on it. And it's dead easy, <laughs> dead easy to fake it, isn't it? Dead easy to fake. But they were always like this. They were on the tilt, tilt uh, and there was, you know, they were dark around the edges and fuzzy around the edges. And that's, that's the sort of images that he, he made. And I just found that that lens sort of lent itself to those sort of images. So that's my Ted Sirius fake. So I'm faking the fakes that Ted Sirius did. <laughs> I don't know if you'll be able to tell how soft that is from back there, but that's pinhole, 5.4 pinhole camera. Film, it? It's HP5, and the camera was a Mike Walker panel camera, the one that Ilford produced. Right, I won't show you this one just yet. Um, these next two are, are fuzzy because of camera shake. Now, normally that is taboo, isn't it? We don't show people pictures with camera shake. But I was at the seaside, and it was a lovely sunny day. There were lots of people running about. I'm walking along with, I've got a rangefinder 6x7 camera. The plow bell, no, it's not plow bell, what is it? Forget now. It's a borrowed one, I can't remember who, what it is. But it's, it's got lovely optics, it's a really superb camera. And I saw these elements come together where was, I could see some people and I could see a dog running in and some people in the distance. And I thought, if I get this just timed right when that dog runs into the middle, it'll all balance. And I was a bit too eager with the shutter and it just introduced a little bit of shake. But I print it up nonetheless because I still think it's got something about it. I think it's just after the decisive moment, to be, to be fair, because I think the dog should have been a bit further back and that person should have been, so that they were lined up, that probably would have been a bit better, but we can't have everything. And I'm going to blame the cow for the camera shake on this picture because it was over here and it took so long to get into the prime position. The light <laughs> levels had really dropped and I didn't have enough, you know, I didn't have enough light to get a fast shutter speed to freeze movement. But I still like it anyway. Again, this is one that I'd rather have as a soft image than not have at all. On the west coast of Scotland, you've still got these lovely old telegraph poles. And on this particular evening, as the sun was just coming up, sorry, the moon was just coming up, everything just fell into place. And that's when the magic happens. It's all, for me, it's not about the subject matter, it's about shapes and tones, how they happen within a space. And that, that's something that I'll come back to again and again with these pictures. So moving on from Dusk to night. That was my first successful night shot, and the reason why I then went on to do much more night photography. If that evening had been a disaster, I might never have done any others. But that. I've written a book. I've written a book about it, thank you. Yeah. You've got the book now? I am. <laughs> That's in Nottingham. Yeah, but it's the shapes again for me. It's the shapes that get me first of all. Yeah, yeah. I think when you show pictures to people who are not visually aware, yeah. um, maybe like a butcher, for instance, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> they, their, their, first, their first comment, <laughs> the first comment you get is, um, 
why have you taken a picture of that? Because they're just interested in the subject. But that's not why I take pictures. It doesn't matter what the subject is. It's, it's a, whether those shapes and tones work yeah. as an image, you know. That's what John Bowles was about, wasn't it? That was a particularly magic night when <coughs> everybody was indoors, but it, it snowed heavily and the snow was stuck to everything, the wires, the branches, everything. Uh, and I went out with a twin lens reflex and one roll of film and, and got lots of images that I was really pleased with. Was the temptation to make the snow as white as possible? Um, well, yes, I mean, uh, the, you could print it with the snow white there, but then the eye wouldn't be drawn up to there. The eye would be dancing around down here. Yeah. So it, it often the way I print is to suggest a spotlit area and, and not make all the tones just look uniform. Uh, by contrast, there's no manipulation on this one at all. This is exactly as it was. And that's again on the little folding six by six netar. No, actually, it's the one I like the least. Yeah, yeah. I think the uh, five by four, ten eight, six seven format is perhaps my favourite. But I tend to use thirty five mil more just because it's convenient. And often, I'm with my wife, and she's got no patience. So, <laughs> you know, if I'm going anywhere, she's not going to wait while I set something up on a tripod. So it's it, it, it usually nice to be thirty five mil or something light. Uh, a night shot up near Castle Hill in Huddersfield. What drew me to this particular scene was the light on in the windows, first of all, but the fact that there's a lovely shadow there which makes the light more apparent. But then when you think about what that shadow is coming from, it's actually just coming from that telegraph pole there, and it's being spread along the wall because of the angle <laughs> of, of the light. And there's a tiny little fall pipe there, and that's spreading a wide shadow as well. I do like uneven plastering. Something about it, the way that sh shadows fall across uneven plaster is much more interesting to me than a, a perfect modern building. Oh, this one's from this, that, the evening when it snowed heavily. And that was the one that ended up on the front cover of the book on night photography. That one's quite tricky to print. That is a, a pain. Trying to keep detail in the dark areas here and then burn in these highlights without it looking obvious that they've been burnt in. So do you use pyro for that? Huh? No, it was before I knew about pyro. So it's just at ID11, but I had to make um, special masks to burn in certain areas. <laughs> and it's quite long and involved, that one. Okay, so we're on to a different section now. Um, I used to be able to go out and take pictures any time I liked, and then I had kids. And then, you know, we know, we know don't we? we can't, you can't get out, you can't get the kids organised, you can't take your camera gear out. You look out the window and you see great clouds and you think, oh, I wish I could be out, and you can't do it. So instead of getting frustrated, I decided I would look for things around the house to take pictures of. So toys, um, furniture, food, the kids, all sorts of things. So that's, that's what this next section <coughs> is about. That's just a, a shot of our crunky old kitchen table. I do like di diagonals in an image. I think you can make a strong image out of quite a simple subject by utilising diagonals. Anyone with small children or grandchildren will recognise what that is? Yeah? Plastic bib? Yeah. I just like the circular composition of it in the low sunlight. We all love to see little tiny hands and feet, don't we? And it's difficult to put across how what the scale is, the difference, and 
have shot hands in, in hands and things like that. But this particular time, he's only a week old, um, that's my son, um, and I wanted to take it on a, on a medium format camera. So this is on the RB67, but there was no way I could look into the camera and be in the shot at the same time. So I had to get a friend to be the stand-in for the adult feet there. And of course, you'll see toys all over the place when you've got kids around the house, and often you'll find humorous little setups like that. That wasn't, I didn't make that, that's just exactly as I found it. This one's a pedal car, and that one's a clockwork one. So did you lay down to get that on Andrew? Yeah. <laughs> And then, of course, they make things out of plasticine. That must have been about this big. And I had to quickly get it and put it by the window and get a shot of it before it became a mess again and became something else. Did you model for it? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Old wooden skittles there again, just only about uh, five or six inches high, and I had to get the camera really low down. Um, I had to fire the flash off the off the ceiling to get enough exposure indoors, so it was a little bit hit and miss, but uh, pleased with the result. So one Christmas, the children all got little hole stamps, so they they punch holes in things to make stars and whatever other patterns. And so they were all delighted with this and they would get the Christmas paper and just make lots of holes and then drop the paper on the floor. And I just liked the way, from a certain angle, it looked like the American flag. And it wasn't deliberate, it was just the, the arrangement of, of the stars and the, and the, the stripes and the, t and the tones just suggested that. So I got the, actually did it with a 5.4 camera resting on the ground and deliberately used the shallow focus so you can't tell which is in the foreground and which is in the background. I like to sometimes keep a bit of mystery in a picture so the viewer has to think about an image a bit more and, and look at it, not just glance and walk away, you have to sort of think about things a little bit. So sometimes you can do that with the focus, sometimes you can do it with the lighting. Shapes and tones. It's just playing about with simple shapes at home. Is that in natural light of you? Yeah, it's natural yeah. light. But that's going back to the 5x7 camera again with the photocopier lens on it. So it's just trying to get the plane of focus roughly in the right area just to bring out some parts of the image. It's amazing how you can make stunning photos from the ordinary around the house. Th it's good practice. It's good practice to see because when you do go somewhere that, that's impressive it makes it easy actually I think it's the other way around you go somewhere that's a stunning location it's very hard to get a good picture from it, it it's odd I think it's it's probably because we're so used to seeing pictures of these places that they're not special anymore on a, on a picture um, this was taken at my mother-in-law's house we turned up she lived in Nottingham we'd driven down to see her and as soon as we got in, my wife's talking to her mum about stuff, whatever women talk about. And so I'm looking around for something to take pictures of. And she was getting ready to do Sunday lunch. So I saw this stuff in the kitchen. And all I did was stand that fork. Well, no, I'll put that there. I put, I, it's, it was in the light and everything looked interesting, but it, it needed something down here. So I just arranged things to m make it a bit more pleasing in the composition. We were shelling peas one day for, for the kids for one weekend and I just had a thought about how they're all the same but they're all different. So we try and put that across in a picture. We all know what a pea pod looks like but the arrangement of peas in each one is different. So I just picked one out with the focus and let the others fall away. 
I did photograph them from above, first of all, but it was just too bland, too much like a record shot, so I, I didn't use that image. So once I'd got it in my head that I, I wasn't going out to take pictures for some time, as I say, I was looking around the house, trying to see po picture possibilities everywhere. And they turned up in surprising places. <laughs> so one evening we're doing the washing up and a giant item and put it down. And when they turn around and look at it again, suddenly it looks like something else. It looks like a Dalek. Occasionally, not very often. Um, and I don't like flash. I hardly ever use flash. And that's mainly because the shadows are such an important part of the composition. With flash, you can't see, with a hand flash, for instance, you can't predict where the shadows are going to be, and they can often ruin the picture, and the lighting's rather harsh as, as well. So having this sort of way of looking at things differently, not just going out and exploring in the landscape and taking pictures, but really looking at things at home, made me, made me find beauty in all sorts of ordinary places. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the news media would have you believe that everything in the world is horrible, but if you actually look around and open your eyes, there's beauty everywhere. The composition of that was actually slightly accidental. Um, this flower was growing in, in a pot in the garden and they had these lovely hairy sort of things around the, the leaves I've never seen before. And I wanted to photograph it, but when I was just pointing a camera at it, I mean, there was the surrounding stuff, there was the pot, there was the soil, everything was distracting. So I put some pieces of white paper around the plant, thinking I'd be able to isolate it, not realizing that the shadows would show up. But it just looks, it makes that look like a little vase. And then that looked like a background. It was quite odd how it happened. But I think it's, sometimes when things go wrong, it, the result is better than maybe what you intended to do in the first place. So sometimes it's worth going with it and, and making it a feature. It's a new shoot on a cactus about this sort of, height and before the metal before the spines come out the spiky bits it has these rubbery things on which make it look a bit comical that's shot on 5.4 because you can get the extension to get really close up It looks a bit like a double exposure, but it's not. My dad had a conservatory, and the sunlight would come in one direction and then bounce off the glass at the other side to throw shadows in a different direction. So this area looks like a double exposure, but this area looks like a single exposure. I'm often um, attracted by shadows. I think they make all sorts of images much more interesting. Now, we haven't had a telly at home for 30 years. So in the evenings when the kids have gone to bed and I'm looking around for things to photograph, sometimes you have to get a little bit inventive. That's called palm tree. bought two of these heads at auction. Um, they're just concrete painted brown to look like bronze, but they're still quite interesting to photograph. And on this particular day, I'm shooting on a quarter plate, a Thornton Picard quarter plate wooden camera with an Aero lens, I don't know if anyone's familiar with those, 
old aircraft lenses, very shallow focus, but lovely lenses to use. And I wanted to do some pictures of this head. I had, I had photographic paper in the back as well, so it's a very slow emulsion. And the light was low, so I had to put it by the window to get enough light for the exposure. Only later when I see the image do, it, do, do I think it looks like a cross. It looks like you're looking up at Christ on the cross, and that was totally unintentional. But having spotted it later, I, you know, I quite like it for that reason. Flower shots. Uh, we often have a lot of flowers at home. My wife likes to grow flowers and buy flowers. Um, but just a simple flower, set of flowers in a vase can be a bit boring, so I try and vary the way that I photograph them. This is just an empty cardboard box. As you can see, that's the opening of the box. Just to give a dark background and, so, and so, something a bit more unusual around the outside. Now that, I intend to colour this one. I do a lot of hand colouring, and that's what this, this one's uh, got in store. I only printed it recently, so it's not, uh, I've not had a chance to start on it yet. This, this is a lovely paper that Ilford make called um, Art 300, and it's like a watercolour paper. So it's absolutely wonderful for, for colouring in. You can use paints, dyes, pencils, Spotted what it is? Yeah, it's tea, yeah, it's tea bags, yeah. So usually at this stage, I ask people what they think that is. Now, many of you might remember from the last time I was here. But, um, it is cheese, yeah. And the, the, I've had all sorts of people set, come up with suggestions of, is it um, eggs floating in milk and things like that? People get very confused about the shapes. And the reason for that is because they assume it's lit from above, but it's not, it's lit from below. If I turn it the other way up, the shapes make more sense. Yeah? Yeah, so that, that's going in now. And when you see it the other way, you assume that it's sticking out, and that's when you get confused. When I first saw it, I thought it was... Fruit and carnation cream. Yeah, yeah. So here's one that illustrates the principle of shapes and tones. So we have the egg shapes there, and then they're echoed in the basket, and then they're exaggerated in the shadow, but there's still a symmetry to it. So I was just at a friend's house. Uh, he made me a cup of tea, didn't give me a spoon or any sugar. And when I asked for a spoon, he said, look in that drawer in front of you, when I pulled the drawer out, there were all these amazing spoons. So I just had to set them out on the table and pull the table lamp, the, the room light across a little bit and get a shot from above. What appealed to me about this was the way that just a simple shape like an egg can be distorted by the reflection. It, it, it's so distorted that it looks like the yolk has come out of the egg and spread around, but that's actually just the reflection of the white of the egg. Another one taken at my mother-in-law's house. In fact, it might have even been the same day as the cauliflower picture. So 
So again, looking for pictures in ordinary places, trying to find interesting shapes. You really get a bottle of wine and it's got like a lattice work of wire around the top. Yeah. And that's all that is. I came downstairs early one morning and in the fireplace was the remains of a, a clothing catalogue that had been burnt and it was still in perfect shape. It, it, but it looked like flaky pastry. So I had to carefully lift it out and put it by the window where I could get a picture of it. You were looking in for the piece? Yeah, 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 it was tricky to get it out. So thinking again in terms of shapes and tones, I was out with the dog one day and I just saw a little bit of light in the grass and when I stooped down to look at it, it was a fragment of thick glass. I think it must have been almost a half an inch thick, this, this glass, uh, shattered and scratched. So I brought it back to the darkroom to make a, an image of it and it's got all these bits of grass stuck to it. So they, they look a bit like insects trapped in amber. It reminds me of wall paintings. Yeah. Yes, it does look a bit like that, yeah. Another picture made from a couple of finds out walking. An old skull and a teasel. And I just love the way the teasel curls around. I always thought that would look great as a tattoo or the front cover of a heavy metal band album. So at home again, no TV, evening, looking around for things to make an image from. So I'm starting to, instead of just looking for things like toys and things like that, I'm starting to set things up and put things together to make compositions. So it's the back of a picture frame, strung with wire and two metal ornaments. It just gives a suggestion of a hillside behind a farmer and his cow. Rusty old tobacco tin, <coughs> shell, a bit of <coughs> soldering wire and a leaf. Initially, I was just photographing these two objects because I thought that was had a similar shape to it than the, as to the curls within the shell. But it wasn't enough. I needed something else in the image to to balance it out. More toys, uh, small lead animals. Can I ask how long it took to put the lead toys in their position? Yeah, it's, it, I do like to take my time over stuff like that. So I'm looking at it and I'm going back to the camera and I'm looking at it again and moving things a tiny bit and thinking, oh, that, that line's up there. I can't see that because of the shadow and things. So yeah, it does take quite, quite a while, but that, that's meditative. I quite like that part of it. No, no. I don't bracket when I'm outside, I don't bracket with night shots, I don't bracket with still lives, I don't bracket with portraits. Um, and that partly comes from always being on a tight budget for film and also I think if you get it wrong you learn quicker. Yeah, if you make a mistake you're going to learn not to do that next time so it's a valuable lesson if you've lost a shot. So it's probably, uh, no I just don't agree with it, it's, it's lazy, you know. So another lead figure, only about this sort of size, and a greetings card. I just loved it, how it almost looked like a, a negative shadow from the giraffe. Do you use an exposure meter on any guys about a camera? Well, a lot of the cameras don't have meters in, so it's, it's usually a hand meter or a spot meter. Yeah. So a bunch of images, a bunch of objects rather, from my studio arranged in a still life. I 
Everyone okay? Do you want a short break, a cup of tea? Should we have a little break? Yeah. Yeah. I know we're recording. Yeah. Do you get any sort of... I don't want to say advice. Do I get any something? Do you get any sort of comments from your wife, being a social artist? Does she offer to... Or is she just going to say, it's, it's very nice? Uh, no, she's an odd fish, my wife. So, I don't get any... Yeah, I know. I will edit this bit out. Virtually no encouragement, um, a lot of criticism, <laughs> um, but she knows how I think. And uh, previous girls I've been out with just didn't get it at all. And I would have the piss taken out of me for wanting to photograph the cracks in the pavement or something, you know what I mean? But she actually gets it. But she's, her area is painting, my area is photography. And so she just lets me get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she's fine. If I bring any junk into the house or things I've found, that's fine because she understands exactly why. Yeah. Didn't want it lying around for ages, you know, that bird skull or whatever, you know. So, yeah, you get, you get pressure to move things on after a little while. I just yeah. <laughs> so one more there that's done with found objects. Um, took a bit of carrying back to the house. A bent iron bar, about this long. A bit of plywood and a roofing slate. I photographed it from above, but I didn't want shadows to interfere with the shapes. So I did a long exposure and I had a lamp which I moved around above the camera. So it's got the effect of ring lighting. It was done over a long exposure. Shapes, shapes and tones. This is actually a, a type of roll film that somebody gave me, which is photographic paper. Uh, and I tried putting it through the camera and it got jammed. And I was really annoyed that I'd wasted this opportunity to try this stuff. And I thought, well, if I can't take a picture on it, perhaps I can take a picture of it. And so I just put it on the table and did a really shallow focus of the, the lovely shapes. Any ideas? Pen knife. Yeah, you've seen these before. <laughs> well, I, the little font doesn't give it away. Yeah, it does, yeah. Is it a Swiss knife? It's an old army knife. Oh, right. mm. Any suggestions? Is it a cliff, a chalk face or something? No. Blade? No. <laughs> it's tissue paper. Well, it's lit from behind and lit from above, so it, it's, it's, it's confusing. It looks like a cliff face, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I love the way you've got all the texture and the, the shadows and tones. Shapes and tones. Yeah. Can you use some narrow stuff to turn it around? Is it my work or your thoughts? Yeah, well, I just shot it and then I just viewed the print whichever way it works best. Yeah. Yeah, it's the handle of a paper carrier bag. But I love that it's almost like a calligraphy shape. If you make a line with a wide nibbed pen, you get that similar shape. Can I just ask you about the cropping the top? Yes. The... Would you not do that? No, I'm asking the thought behind that. Okay. Well, you can, with, with circles or anything similar to that, you can, you can make them go out of the frame or you can exclude them from the frame because you, mentally your imagination makes up for it. You don't have to have it in. And when I'm doing shapes and tones, when I'm thinking about shapes and tones, it's not just the shape of the bag, it's that black shape and it's that black shape and it's that black shape. So it's the in-between shapes as well. And that would be all joined up together if I'd kept the top of the yeah. bag in, yeah. which would alter it. Ideas? It looks like a root system to me, but... It does look like a root system, but it isn't. Paintwork that's strong. No, it's not paintwork. 
fish leaf? No. Can you see bits of gravel down here? So it's a 12 inch paving stone, concrete paving stone that has started to deteriorate. It's on a coastal path and the salt water's got into it. And over the years it's started to deteriorate. Oh, that was well spotted. But it could be um, electrical discharge, couldn't it? It could be the roots of a mushroom or something. Crime scene. <laughs> <laughs> Shadows of the beach or something, reflection. Is it a splatter? Is it a splatter, Chris? <laughs> yeah. We've got, we have um, a big old blackboard on the wall at home that we keep notes on and it gets very dusty. So I take it outside and I spray it down with a hose pipe and I just splashed a bit of water on it and thought, oh, that looks quite interesting. Did a shot before I washed it. Pond. It does look like a frozen pond. Yeah, that's not what it is. You know the temporary road signs at the side of the road? When they're new, they have a lacquer on the back of them. And then they, just, they get thrown in the back of the van over and over again, and they get dented and they get scratched. And where the lacquer gets scratched, the rust starts to eat away at the metal plate. And that's what it is. It's just a close-up of a, the back of a sign. Did they actually take the signs away where you live then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you text my wife. Yes, it is. Yeah. So it's a paddling pool with leaves that are blown on, and then you get these distorted shadows at the bottom of the water because of the surface tension. Definitely shapes and tones. Okay, as a subject matter, not very interesting, but I love the jumble of shapes and the way that the shadows change those shapes. What's the scale of that? Is that room inside a room? There's a chair there. Okay. So it's bits of furniture. That's a that's a, a plank. <clears throat> My dad used to run an antique business, and in the cellar where things were getting mended, there was always bits lying around that were kept for. You know, mending other things. You mean mending or restoring? Yeah, restoring, shall we say, yeah. yeah. I'm often looking for echoes in a picture. So there's that window is echoed by a smaller window there, and then that shape's echoed by a smaller shape there. And then you've got slight diagonals of the receding shapes there. So it sort of comes together. It's an old jumper that my mum stitched the bottom of to, to keep pegs in. She hangs it on the, hung it on the washing line to keep pegs in. Different generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, a snow scene, which is definitely about shapes and tones. So you've got these broken up shapes, but. Looking at the reflections, you've got another world going on there. It's like you can see through into another dimension. And you've got these in-between shapes as well, as we, as we refer, referred to before. There's a, an Escher print called Three Worlds or something, isn't there? Which... Ah, yeah, yeah. I suppose it is a bit like Escher. Yeah, it has the plane, obviously, of the, the ground. There's the puddle with the reflection with leaves on the top. Yes, I have seen that. And then there's a fish in the water in the yeah. pool underneath. Yes. Maybe I had that in the back of my mind. Maybe I did. That's uh, Glasgow Botanical Gardens. Again, just lovely shapes to play with. Um, I didn't put the circle in the middle. That would have been a bit too obvious.
uh, walking across a, a dried up reservoir near where we live, I found this. So somebody had obviously lobbed it in the water, it sunk into the silt, and then when the reservoir dried, it cracked around it. I like the way you put it in the middle and not on the third. Yeah, yeah. I never used the thirds. <laughs> it's so overused. Right, this is one where I see something, I get the right lens on, and I'm thinking, right, if I just hang around a minute until somebody walks across there, everything's going to come together. Yeah? Yeah. A touch of the air there, Erwood. I suppose so, yeah, yeah. Just tell me about your borders, please. Okay. I, sometimes I keep the negative border in, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm a bit neat, sometimes I don't. Um, just how the fancy takes me. So I have a, a negative carrier that's been filed out. So the light's shining through the edges outside of the frame area. And it's a bit rough, so sometimes you get this overspill. Sometimes I have a card mask or a masking frame to just trim that a bit so there's a simple black line, but it's neat. Sometimes I just think, what the hell? A swimming pool um, on a summer's day, when the sunlight shines through it, you get these lovely bright patterns on the bottom. So to accentuate that, I used a deep red filter and I asked my daughter to throw this big uh, ball's about this size, I said throw it in the water, and then it left this sort of ripply pattern. I have a good friend who uh, comes around once a month or so, we get together and we wander off and take pictures together. Uh, I've known him a long, long time. He's quite tall, he's got wild hair, he's got big hands, he's very, very expressive in his movements. And we were sitting at the table having a coffee and he stopped talking and his hand came to rest and I just said, Paul, keep still. And I put the 135 lens on, I went around to the other end of the table and shot that. So well, if you know Paul, it's, that's Paul being quiet. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> he's always expressive. This was a bit of a shocker. Um, just walking along locally where I live, there were sort of little areas where there used to be outside toilets and are now where people keep their bins. And I just glanced sideways and saw this and thought, whoa, and I had to go back. It was only 100 yards from home. I had to go back and get the camera and set it up. So I didn't alter anything. That's exactly as I saw it. It looks slightly unreal, doesn't it? It looks very restful. Restful? You have the dog sat there. Yeah, she's a very laid back dog. It's a reservoir. This bit is where the overflow would be from the top reservoir to the lower reservoir. So it's quite a drop from here to there. It's with a 135 lens, so I've got no chance of getting the depth of field from here to here. But I concentrated on the tree area and its reflection and left her go a little bit out of focus. Just because it just gives an odd depth to it. And it's, there's something like a, Jap about a Japanese print to, about it. To me. I can't quite work out what it is, but I do like the image. It looks like there's two images. One, yeah, it does look like... If you turn through 180, then the, the other thing... Almost like a playing card. Mm -hmm. Yes, it looks like that. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what that looks like then. I've never looked at it upside down. So yeah, that looks like it's, it's upright, doesn't it? It doesn't look right. Mm -hmm. you know? Again, yes, and, and making people look at a picture for a bit longer than a quick glance. Um, you know, everyone's heard the, the term, uh, this, this, the decisive moment, and that sometimes happens where you get a moment where you have to make a decision to take a picture or you've lost it. 
And this happened when we were in Norfolk. We, when the kids were small, we took them on a steam train and told them it was Thomas the Tank Engine. And while we were waiting in the station, the steam was blowing across. And I thought, oh, if I'll just lean out the window, I might get a nice picture of the steam and the carriages. There was another carriage next to us. And a little boy popped his head out of the window to see what I was doing. And that moment, I just quickly fired the shot, and then he was gone. And all I had was a little half-frame Olympus Pen EE2, I think it was. It's been really popular, that image. I think it's probably because it sort of makes people think of evacuation and that sort of time period because of the, the date of the trains. Yeah. This was another one where I had to make a quick decision. So there are a lot of reservoirs around where we are. And in, towards the end of the year, when the leaves blow off the trees, where the water runs under these little bridges to get the reservoir, it often gets blocked. So the silt builds up. I looked over the bridge, and there was all these lovely patterns in the silt. And I was just about to take a picture, and somebody's dog ran down to jump in the water, and suddenly had second thoughts. So my first thought was just to photograph this because it looked like some sort of uh, close-up of Saturn or something, you know. But then, as soon as the dog came in the corner, it made it completely different. It made it There's something odd about it. So whenever I go to the seaside, I'm always looking at rock shapes, patterns, shells marks in the sand, things like that. And I was walking around, it's actually in France, I can't remember the location, but I was off wandering while they were, the rest of the family were sunbathing. I was looking for pictures and I thought, there's something going on here. And I photographed it, and when I looked at it from a different angle, it looked like something completely different. It suddenly looks like a big red Indian face or something, you know? That's the choice you'd have to make if you frame it. Yeah, yeah. Because like that, it just, it's just a bunch of interesting rocks. But as a face, it just becomes something else. Yeah. There used to be a lot of these places around the home valley. Not anymore, they've all been done up into fancy houses but you could wander freely in these places and take pictures for many years. I know this looks like a tumble-down wreck, but it's actually the staircase to my studio. <laughs> I've been up that route a million times, but on one particular day, I just saw the picture possibilities and I happened to have a 5.4 with me and a tripod. Got a lot of times quality out of that picture. I hope so because that's what, something I'd like to include, to make a feature of pictures, make them timeless because, if, and often I don't include, mostly I don't include cars and things like that or anything to date a picture because I like the sense of timelessness. It could have been taken 100 years ago or yeah. two days ago. Yeah. This is the same building, but a different staircase. Many, many years ago, I started using paper in the back of the camera instead of film, mainly because I ran out of money to buy film and I had lots of paper left over. So I started playing around with it. And this was just putting a little piece of paper in the back of a folding six by nine camera. And my darkroom was in the cellar at the time. So as I came out of the cellar, uh, out the cellar room there was this light coming down the stairs and I thought this is an ideal place to try this paper negative out and it was it, it just really worked for me so that image then spurred me on to do a lot more work with paper negatives which I've sort of got into and then gone out of favour with over the years and at times I've done a lot more work on it and then other times I've been distracted by other things but the, re the next batch of images are all paper negative so this is paper in the back of a quarter plate Thornton Picard. It's the Aero Ectar lens again, which has a lovely quality, but there's something about the tonality with paper negative which is quite different from film. First of all, it's green and blue sensitive, 
So reds and oranges come out darker. But also the, there's, you've got movement because it's such a slow speed. But the tones tend to flatten off in the highlights in a way that I found rather interesting. Uh, so can I just ask about the using the paper negatives? Yeah. So what difference, other than the speed, do you have to take into account? I mean, are you using any sort of filter or can't you use any sort of filter? Or? I see a lot of rubbish written about paper negatives where people put multigrade filters in front of the camera to change the contrast of the scene. Yes, it's possible, but oh, you just end up with a really muddy, horrible image that you can't use. Uh, contrast is controlled by development, not by filtration. Yeah. When the paper's only sensitive to blue and green light, you don't have a facility to use an orange filter or a red filter because there's nothing going to get on the, on the emotion, is it? No. So, so you do it by development? You do it by development, yeah. Does that, is that sort of like normal developer, you know, one to nine or whatever it is, or, or do you dilute it more and try and... We haven't got the time to get into it now, but if you'd like to come to me for a workshop... <laughs> 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 oh, you did a short workshop with me, did you? Yeah. Pretty straightforward. Um, <laughs> some of the old papers that I use, and I use quite a lot of old papers, um, have deteriorated over the years, and they've got a slight mottled look to them, which um, int introduces a kind of a texture to the image. So this, this one illustrates how the tones flatten off in the highlights. And it's a look that is very similar to old glass negatives. If you print from overexposed old glass negatives, you'll find that the tonality sort of compresses up towards the higher end. Paper in the back of the 5.7, again, with the um, lens from a photocopier that has no depth of field. My wife had an obsession with buying angle poise lamps for a while. So they were all over the place. But my earliest influence, my earliest inspiration in photography was the photo secessionists. The, pictorialist in the early days, so that's my homage to um, those photographers, Steichen mainly. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, what they call a close in Glasgow, so it's an enclosed area looking at the back window of somebody's flat and the, you've got this bank of windows at different heights and I just love the picture possibility of it is there was something like the old Fritz Lang film a little bit like that sort of somehow in the past but somehow futuristic as well So working with paper negatives over the year, years, I started to add pencil to the negatives to alter the tones in the final print. So a little bit of pencil over here and here and here just makes it look a bit more interesting than a flat grey sky. So you'll see some more examples of this technique as we go along, some a little bit more adventurous than that. So there's not, not much done to there. This is darkened down. There's a little bit of highlight over there, but that's about it. Again, shapes and tones, form, first and foremost, shapes and tones. The curve of that skyline echoes the curve of the road, and then you've got the three white objects in the middle. Is it possible for me to ask how you get a 5 by 7 paper negative to that size? You enlarge it. You stick it in the enlarger. Yeah? I don't know why, where this originated, but so many people, especially Americans, think that you can only contact print paper negatives, and they go, can you enlarge it? Oh, oh, well, I never thought of that, but of course you can. It's just, light goes through it. Look, you just have to give it more light, you know? What might be a 20-second exposure with film might be four minutes with paper, but it's possible, yeah. yeah? 
get a preference for the paper? Uh, yes, but I have very little of that particular paper. That's uh, kept me an art document, which I absolutely love. And that's in what gives this particular texture. Um, it was a thin fiber-based paper on an art surface, and when you used it as a paper negative, there was a certain texture that came through. It might look, seem like grain from where you're looking there, but when you look close, it's like tweed. It's got a kind of a woven look to it, which, which I really liked. And it took pencil really well, so it was ideal. I think the texture's a bit more obvious on this one. It depends on the size of the negative, so if you're working with a 6.9 neg, by the time you get it up to this size, the, the texture's quite obvious. If you're working with a 5.4 or larger, it's not so obvious. Can you see the pattern in, in there a bit? Yes. Yeah. Paper negatives, give, paper negatives gives you a, a pictorial style much easier than working with film. You, your detail tends to be subdued, so you're mainly looking at the shapes. And then once, once you start manipulating the tones, then it sort of strays into pictorial territory. So after working with paper in the camera for a while, and then experimenting with pencil work on the back, I was looking at some images on a contact sheet, and I thought, oh, I wish I'd taken that on paper negative. And they were shot on film, and I thought, well, I could make a paper negative from the film original, and then I've got the best of both worlds. So the image I tried first of all was this shot where I'd been out, just wandering around, seen these two cows in the foreground, and I thought, oh, okay, it gives it a little bit of depth. This cow turned around, and I thought, okay, that looks quite interesting, take it now. When I did the print, there was just nothing really that grabbed me about it. It didn't quite work. So I thought, we'll use this for a paper negative. Get rid of that side, crop it in, into a vertical, and we'll start working on some of the tones to make it look a bit more interesting. And so it became that. So by this stage, I've got a bit more practice at it, but so the process is that instead of having a paper negative and adding pencil to put a highlight in, now I have a film original, I make a small print. If I add density to that and then make a negative from it, I've altered the shadows, yeah, or I've added tone into the highlights. That's now all on the negative. And now if I add pencil on the negative, I'm lightening areas in the final print. So that allowed me to put a shadow in, a highlight in, highlights on the muscle, darken that cow down, put the highlights in the trees, put some sky in and a board around it. So if you go back to the original now, you'll see the difference. Yeah? So I got it worked out, I was all excited about it, I made the print, did the pencil work on the back, made the negative, pencil work on the back, that did a print, it didn't work. So I had to go right back to the beginning, I've made some, some stupid mistakes, I had to make another positive, do the pencil work all again, another neg, and so on. And when I got it right, that then set me off doing a lot of other stuff in that style. So I've got another couple of examples here which I've got the before and after shots of. So a simple snapshot, but I've got barbed wire going across here. This is, I, like, I love the way the little lambs are looking around behind mum, but the tree appears to be coming out the back of her head. And there's another one over there which is distracting, so it needed quite a lot of work. So by raising that banking there, I managed to get rid of that other sheep. And I managed to draw out that distracting thing there by adding tone on the negative. That's at the middle of a 6-6 negative. I couldn't get very close to this ram. It was in a field. But I liked it. I liked its position. That needed to go. It needed a bit of a sky.
And when you're making paper negatives, you, you, you're not limited to a particular format. You can make them any shape and size that you like. So you can make the format fit the scene and the composition that you're after. Did you do any work to bring the cloud out of that? The clouds as it is, on the first print I burnt the sky in above there. I burnt this in at the bottom and then on the paper negative I put the pencil work in there to suggest sunlight. This one's shot in the middle of a day, white sky, nothing particularly interesting, but I like the juxtaposition between the house and the trees. So I made a print, first of all, but I made it too dark. I made a negative, which looks a bit on the thin side, and then I added a bit of intense pencil in one spot. And so it looks like evening, and it looks like there's a light on. But that's just done with pencil. That's in Manchester. So I subdued the cars. So there's a suggestion of them, but they're not dominating the, 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 the composition. And then I put a patch of sunlight in over there. I didn't even see the cars too much, did I? Oh, look at all the building. That's what you're supposed to look at, yeah. That's the only one in the box that had a digital origin. It was taken on a little compact digital camera. And I wanted to see if I could make a paper negative from a digital original. And, and it worked, but I didn't pursue it as a, a project. It did, didn't particularly interest me. I do like the texture of the Kempion art paper, but I've got very little of that left now, so I tend to reserve it for certain images. Um, if I remember rightly, this is just a resin coated um, negative for this one, which I tend not to like actually because it's very difficult to add pencil on the back with it being so slippy, they tend to have a, a shiny surface on the back. Um, no, it can't, be, it can't be that. This must be a fibre one because there is some pencil work on this. There's some sort of shading here to suggest light on, a, on the mist. So something like, say, uh, foam or chamois, would that work on? It would, but it'd be a waste of a really nice paper, that, because it's a lovely as a finished paper for printing. Yeah. Um, they used to make um, Ilford multigrade fibre in a single weight. And that was great because you had all the contrast control of a multigrade paper, but a single weight paper is much easier to print from. But they, they stopped making it. I haven't been able to find any since mine ran out. Still will keep flat in its process as a print. Yeah, it's very curly, yeah. yeah. So around the, the year 2000, I got the opportunity to go to do some photography in Libya, of all places. And it was actually a football match, which I wasn't interested in. I borrowed some camera gear to do it. It was quite an interesting trip. But while I was there, I wandered around and took some pictures on my little folding 6x6 camera and then made paper negatives from them afterwards. What size would your paper negatives be? I think these are about three and a half, four inches across. And these are on the single weight multigrade paper. Started life as a six by seven negative, 
then a paper positive, then a paper negative. There's quite a lot of pencil work going on there to make it look more pictorial. It does allow me to get rid of distracting elements. There was a white lean-to there, there was a greenhouse, and there were a lot of distracting puddles here, which I managed to get rid of. Just out of curiosity, where do you try and draw the line between photographer and artist? I don't need to draw a line. I just need to just do the stuff that interests me and try and do it to the best of my ability. I don't worry about what anybody else thinks. I know you've got judges to please. That I can't work that way. I can't let someone else dictate how I have to work. I, I just follow the things that interest me um, and try and overcome certain technical problems to achieve the things I've got in my head. Right, just a few portraits and then we're just about done. So I went for a walk and I had a medium format camera and I walked past this little farmhouse and this old guy was standing outside smoking his pipe and asked him if I could take his picture. And he said, yeah, of course you can, lad. So I did that and we got talking and his house looked really interesting inside. So I said, any chance I could come and do some pictures of you next week in, in your house? And I said, lad, you can, but you better be quick to kick me out in, in a fortnight. So he was, he was being evicted from this place he'd rented for years because some developer wanted to do it up. So I managed to get in, got to know him, did loads of pictures inside, and it was indeed a really interesting place. Esther, a young girl that used to live in our village, who uh, often used to sit for me if I had portrait ideas, and uh, she was just a natural, dead easy to photograph. Well, this, is, this goes back to the 5x7 camera with the photocopier lens, and I had it at home, and our, our friend Joe Aylward came to stay with us, and she's a painter, and she's a very quiet lady, and she sits and reads and she was sit, sitting by the window and I asked her to keep still while I set up the camera. It took 11 seconds to expose that with the slow emulsion and the, the low light, but it has a particular quality that I just couldn't have got any other way. Now one of the things, I, one of the emulsions I use is X-ray film. Uh, X-ray film is often blue sensitive only or sometimes blue green sensitive. So if you use it for portraits, you get pretty get dark skin tones. The speed varies amongst different types. Some, most of them are about 25, uh, 50, sometimes a little bit higher, but I have some that are really, really slow. I have one that's one and a half ASA, and that's what this was taken with, with the Aerovector lens on five by seven. This is also the same technique. I used to photograph people and try and flatter them all the time. And as, as time's gone on, I've got more towards trying to photograph people and reveal something about them. So just let them be themselves and see what, what the picture looks like. And these two used to run a theatre company and they'd asked me to do some pictures. Many years after this picture was taken, this lady developed severe depression. And there's something about her distant look there which sort of foretells the way her life was going to go. I've got another picture which isn't in here. The chap came to me. He's got a small local business and he's very, very active and you know, he's, he looks like he's going places. But when I photographed him and looked at the print, he looked really sad. There was just something about 
it was hard to describe, but it, it was a really powerful sense from the picture. It's not this one, this is somebody else completely. And that's again the X-ray film and the shallow focus. I had an idea that I wanted to try and play about with people's idea of space again, in the way that I did with the um, cheese picture with the light coming the wrong way. I lit the portrait from underneath, but then printed it like a negative so that the light area appears to be coming, from, the light appears to be coming from above, but it obviously isn't because the eyes are empty. So it's a negative portrait lit from underneath. Last one now. We have this head at home. It's made of plaster of Paris. It's been made from a rubber mold that's been made on someone's head. And while the mold has been set in, they've had a slight smile. And it just comes across in the, in the stone, in the, in, the, in the bust itself. And I think, does plaster, anybody know, does plaster of Paris shrink a bit as it dries? because this head is slightly smaller than life size, so it's something peculiar about it, having this texture. It's been left in someone's garden for years. It's got a smile, and it looks a bit smaller than normal, so it, it's peculiar to see. But I love photographing it. Anyway, that's everything, so thank you for your patience, everyone. <laughs> Little plug there. Anybody wants to come for a workshop, just let me know. Yeah. <laughs> Has anybody got any questions for Andrew? Yeah. Do you have in your box any free prints? No, 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 no. In the event of your house catching fire, uh, which one are you going to take? Ooh, that's you a can only one. take the one, yeah. not the box. It's like a TV show, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the one that, um, I don't know, because I think that might change. I think um, often the one I'm excited about is the last one I did. But then when that wears off, I go back to certain favourites. The night shot that's on the front of the book, the night shot that's just inside the book, which was the first one I took. Um, the, one of the ones that I showed you on the beach there with a the big rock in the foreground and a mist behind, that's a favourite. The one with the two leg positions on the, the road and the person walking past in the distance. It's like, don't walk here sort of thing. That one is still a firm favourite. The dog, the dog and the distant tree. So some that still still keep coming back to me, you know. But um, as it do, it just changed day to day. Okay. Well, for today, I was going to suggest if you put your photograph up with it underneath, I'll take a photograph of you with my phone, <laughs> and then we can circulate it. That gets you your photograph and your Instagram account to the members. Okay. Yeah. Make sense. yeah, yeah, I understand, yeah. Is that now? Yeah, I'll do it now. Well, how about that one? That's, uh, that's always been a favourite. It's not going to work if I drop it on the floor, is it? Right. I'll pose here like a rugby player, getting a presentations check. Okay, thank you. Just let them all, I don't have to bracket. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's been a very interesting and inspirational morning for us today. It's one of the best shows we've had here. Thank you very much. Last time was very good. You've given there was not a lot of food for thought about our photography, I think. It wasn't what you worked it to me, it wasn't overcomplicated, it wasn't simple about it, you know. It wasn't overcomplicated, it was very interesting. So I'm really glad I got in touch again, Andrew. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure that I'll see you work again. Well, he's thinking about a return to <laughs> 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 Yeah, he's convinced me that I can. Like you're like getting out of retirement, you know. Getting out of retirement. <laughs>
What do you realise? Is Tell you us down the line. Yeah. Thirty five quid. You really miss these people, my course, here with things. I really ought to get back in there. <laughs> we'll have some lunch then we'll do a show and we'll work. How many have got prints? Right, we'll do the prints first. How many got digital? You've got digital. Just one, just you. Well, we don't have to see it. Three. We'll just save it for next time. So, oh, I can save them for next time. Poor old lamb. I don't need to go in now complaining to you. Oh, yeah. I'm wasting my time. <laughs> have you fetched some? What now? Oh, right. Anyway, we'll, we'll have lunch. Actually. We'll have lunch. And then uh, decide. We'll, have, well, I think the decision's already made, isn't it? Whatever. I mean, there's only the bloody golf on telly. <laughs> Thank you very much.